And you told this guy the pain train's coming, which I would not want to hear. Yeah, I would not want to hear that knowing that this dog was coming after me. Welcome everyone to The Scuttlebutt. I'm your host, Sean Hall. It's so good to have you all join us once again for another episode. Super excited for our topic this, uh, this episode, which is going to be MWDs. What is that? MWDs, Military Working Dogs. We are actually going to be commemorating what was about a week and a half ago, the K-9 Veterans Day. Um, very excited for Bill Jeffcoat to be joining us today. He's uh, the president of Life-Changing Service Dogs for Veterans here in Western PA. We're going to talk about that organization and uh, Bill's uh, service, which uh, we will hear more about in just a second. First, I want to have Catherine. Uh, you're rejoining us here on the Scuttlebutt. Welcome back. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm so excited to be back. I guess the short answer I always give is I'm a wife, mom, news anchor, and proud granddaughter of a World War II Navy veteran. Um, I work at WTRF TV in Wheeling, West Virginia, doing a series called Veterans Voices, where I speak to as many veterans as possible in the Ohio Valley where we work. Um, I just have a great appreciation for them and their service, and i um, excited to be here and learn more about MDWs because I'm an animal lover, proud dog owner, so I'm excited for this talk. I'm going to say MWDs. You said MDWs. MWDs. What? Oh, you know, where's the coffee, right? That's Sorry. just true. Where's the Where's the coffee is is pretty much my slogan for life. <laughs> um, and Bill Jeffcoat, thank you so much for joining us, Bill. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Bill Jeffcoat, um, United States Marine Corps Vietnam combat veteran. Um, Canine handler, uh, war dog. Um, now they call it military working dogs. Uh, I am also the president of Life Changing Service Dogs for Veterans, which is a volunteer organization here in Western Pennsylvania that raises funds so that we can get medical service dogs to the men and women veterans that are suffering from visible and invisible disabilities. Thank you, Bill. And I'm very interested to hear much more about your organization. I know it's been doing incredible work here in Western PA. Um, but I want to jump into some of our, our segments here. Uh, and before we do that, actually, I want to make sure that if you are listening for the first time that you like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell on YouTube. If, if you're hearing Scuttlebutt for the first time, we want to let you know uh, whenever we release our episode, which is always on Monday mornings. Um, so please leave us a comment as well. You can do that on YouTube. You can also do that by emailing me at sean at veteransbreakfastclub.org. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you have reactions to our, this episode or any of the episodes that you end up listening to from the Scuttlebutt. Uh, but first, our first segment of the day, I'm going to jump, jump straight to uh, a word of the day, which we've done before. But this one, I think, is kind of fun. And I think Bill might have some experience with this, is uh, a website called K9 of Mine, K9 of Mine.com. They had a great headline, 150 plus military dog names, a couple of those being Admiral, Bomber, striker, sergeant, chief, ranger. Uh, they kind of run the gamut here. Yankee, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, bayonet, caliber, carbine. Bill, uh, what type of names did you have for your dogs back uh, back in Vietnam? Oh, uh, Fraulein, Andy, uh, King. Um, we had one... Um, Sarge, um, if I would have known, I, I have a, a listing of all the um, canines that were in uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am a life member to um, the uh, Vietnam Dog Handlers Association, and they actually list the names of um, all the canines that were used in Vietnam. So, mm -hmm. uh, and Which probably, how many? How many were there used in Vietnam total? Uh, over four thousand. Wow. Wow. 
Um, Bill, when uh, you name when they name these dogs, are there certain requirements? Like, does it have to be something easy to say when you give commands? Like, are there requirements for names? No, you really, normally when you would give commands, you wouldn't even say the dog's name. Um, Fraulein uh, was able to take verbal commands and also just hand commands. Uh, you know, when you were out in the bush, um, it, you didn't want to give verbal commands so that you could just, you know, designate stay down, uh, come. Um, and uh, even when you started to train dogs, um, there were opportunities that if you were Polish, you could train the dog in Polish, given their commands in that language, mm -hmm. so that as, uh, as the dogs were deployed throughout the world, and, and like over in Korea, if in fact the dog would have been uh, taken and the, the Koreans tried to, to give the dog a command, uh, being that it was trained in Polish, the dog wouldn't respond. So, wow. It, 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 it's pretty amazing. There were guys that actually were able to spell. They would go D-O-W-N and the dog would go down. Uh, That's amazing. We're going to have our final guest introduce himself. This is Andrew Kautko. Am I pronouncing that last name correctly, Andrew? I have you muted. Yes, sir. I apologize about the tardiness on that one. No worries. Uh, but I should let our audience know that you are joining us from Okinawa, so we can completely understand the time difference here um, and that you are on base, correct? I am. Well, my name is Andrew Kalko. Um, I spent 13 years of my career in the military working dog program uh, as part of the United States Marine Corps. Um, worked my way up all the way from a PFC dog handler all the way up to the second command up at the Pentagon. So, I have a lot of experience with dogs, a lot of experience with building uh, the administration side and the operational side. And basically the way that the handlers do things nowadays, you know, we were able to kind of build off that and really kind of what uh, Mr. Jeff Coat down there was talking about in regards to, you know, the way they used to do it and how we build upon it nowadays. We'll ask Andrew the same question that we asked Bill. Uh, Catherine, do you want to ask that that same question of Bill or of Andrew? Sorry. Oh, the one about the names? Yes. Yeah, Andrew, I was asking Bill, you know, when you get to name these military working dogs, I always wondered, is it does it have to be something that is easy to pronounce or under certain guidelines? Or can you just have fun with it, especially if it's, you know, the dog that you're working with? Can it be fluffy? Um, be fluffy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so and today, the, we actually do not uh, name the dogs. So there's two different programs we currently use to uh, bring dogs and acquire dogs for the program. It's one through, obviously, procurement, the purchasing phase, where basically your job as a dog handler is to travel all around the U.S. first. And then if you don't get adequate number of dogs, you'll travel around Europe to a bunch of breeders. Um, and then just your entire job is just to drive around, fly around, and buy dogs. A pretty sweet gig um but the dogs come to us pre-named at that point mm -hmm. so they've already started uh preliminary trainings on the dogs um teaching the dog you know testing the dog in hunt drive you know their ability is identify different odor sources and you know putting a kong and a toy in a drawer will the dog react to it um there's a whole big checklist that we go through for that process but then the sec second section is the puppy program. It's the dogs that are born and bred by the military for the military. Um, these dogs know nothing but work life, living in kennels, and they are bred basically for our for our use and you know for the exact purpose that we need them for. But we do name those dogs. Yes. Go, and when it comes, Go ahead. And when it comes to naming those dogs. Um, Every litter has a, they identify the series of the dog. So um, you'll identify it with like a double first letter. So it'll be like BB for 
Born. So if the dog's name is Born, it'll be BB. And then that's how I identify puppy program. And then every dog at that litter will have that double first B, double first C, D, all the way down the line. The, I don't think they can do fluffy, mainly because looking down this list, everything is like Foxtrot. I guess there's a Juliet, Oscar, Quebec, um, Bazooka, Beretta, Bullet, Cannon, Carbine, Gauge, Grenade, Hammer. No fluffy, though. I mean, just to bring a little humor to the situation, if you were a dog, would you want to be fluffy in a room full of dogs that were called like Sarge, and really <laughs> strong names? You know, would you want to be fluffy? No, you want something cool, right? I guess it depends <laughs> on the attitude of the dog. I mean, I had a dog whose name was Sarah. Was Sarah like a cut above the rest? Oh, she was actually, she was absolutely mean. She was absolutely mean. She's retired now, but... She yeah. was a mean, mean animal. Maybe it's the fluffies we have to watch out for. That's, then. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a dog in Vietnam. His name was Caesar. And Caesar was so mean that the other handlers, when, when we talked about him, we used Mr. Caesar. He was that, <laughs> uh, unbelievable. Um, his handler was a, a Marine of color that brushed his teeth with a toothbrush, read comic books to him. Um, Caesar, he was solid black with red eyes. And um, Mr. Caesar was just, he was mean. And when a, when a new, new Marine would come in, into the kennel, uh, would take a, a black uh, muzzle and put on Caesar and walk him through the area and turn him loose on the new guy. And all you could see was this dog just barreling towards him, just growling. And the guy screaming and Caesar would like knock him down and attack him. And uh, it was, that, that, that was the, the newbie introduction into Mr. Caesar. And welcome to Vietnam. Yeah. Mr. Bill, just so you know, uh, things don't change. We still do the same thing. <laughs> I was gonna, that was gonna be my next question, Andrew. <laughs> Absolutely, the new guy always gets the biggest, baddest, meanest dog is there, the first one. Well, I'll tell uh, you what, right, right of passage. Yeah, I was it gonna is. say, that probably gets you to be pretty serious about what this whole program is from the get-go, right? I believe so, because um, you get a whole new respect for them, you know, mm -hmm. when you think you're big and bad and you're, you know, you're a Marine, you're in the world's greatest fighting force, you know, and your head's pumped up since day one of boot camp. Um, and then you finally earn your Eagle Globe and Anchor and you're walking around with a chip on your shoulder. And then all of a sudden you got this little 60, 70 pound dog and it just completely changes the way you look at the world. You know, it, it brings that humility back to some of the young Marines. Yeah. Well, we'll jump into our headlines now. Uh, an, an article that comes from cci.org uh, that told about the study, recent study by the VA that uh, paired service dogs with veterans suffering from PTSD. And they showed, uh, they found through this study that these veterans showed less suicidal ideation and more improvement in mental health than those paired with emotional support dogs, which I'd like to ask a question of our guests uh, here in a second, but the VA estimates that 20 to 30% of veterans live with PTSD. And according to the VA Suicide Prevention Annual Report, nearly 18 service members take their own lives each day as a result of these internal scars. Despite the prevalence of PTSD within the VA population relative to other me mental health conditions, existing treatments tend to be less effective. And veterans also die by suicide at a rate of 50% higher than the non-veteran adult population. So this was a very important study by the VA to see if service animals were able to help veterans. It was a four-year study, and uh, one of the organizations, Canine Companions, uh, was the first and largest provider of service dogs, and they placed 99 dogs with veterans with PTSD. And based on the positive findings of the study, the VA will now allow veterans with PTSD and other mental health diagnoses to be eligible for the VA service dog veterinary insurance benefit, which also covers equipment and travel expenses associated with service dog ownership. 
Um, this was uh, just came out the other day, the results of this study. And uh, I, I found it interesting that at the beginning, it said that as opposed to service animals versus emotional support animals. Uh, can either of you explain to me what the difference is between those? Well, medical service dogs, like you say, are, are trained to, to mitigate the physical and the visible and, and invisible uh, disabilities. And we're talking about uh, PTSD, uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, seizure disorders, insulin dependence, uh, mobility issues. Um, Nightmares? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the, the veterans coming back from Afghanistan, um, one, they're doing multiple tours. Uh, they're coming back with unwanted memories, flashbacks, uh, they want to avoid crowds. Um, the divorce rate is extremely high. Um, so is that not on bill? Is that not unlike sort of what Vietnam veterans may have experienced when they returned from Vietnam? Um, I'll give you my, my own experience when, when I departed Vietnam, and 27 days later, I disembarked in San Diego, California, and was met by crowds of people yelling, screaming, um, throwing things at me, mm -hmm. uh, calling me names. And I was told not to wear my uniform home on leave. Um, when I got home, um, I was with my my mother and my sister and was walking uh, on the main avenue in, in Munhall and went into a store and a car backfired and I went directly to the floor and the people looked at me like I was insane. Mm -hmm. um, when I got out of the military and came back to Pittsburgh, um, I went to the dark side. Um, I was lost. Um, I had no idea of what PTSD was. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I truly struggled. And for me, um, I wanted nothing to do with the VA. Um, and I was lucky, in, lucky enough to meet a young medical student that took me by my hand and kind of helped me. And that was, turned out to be my wife. And um, he still holds my hand and helps me. And that's 52 years from, from being from Vietnam. So, and I only did a tour and a half. Uh, uh, it's, you know, um, Andrew, these, these veterans that are coming back that are doing three tours, five tours, um, the IEDs, the roadside bombs, uh, the traumatic brain injury is just tremendous uh, of, of what they're facing. And without some type of assistance, uh, you know, these veterans go into self-isolation. We have a, a local veteran from Afghanistan that spent eight years in his house. He only went outside uh, to go to the VA or to go to like Walmart at midnight. Uh, couldn't be around people. And he got a service dog. And now he's been with me for 26 different speaking engagements where he goes out and he tells the public uh, about uh, his visible and invisible wounds and how this dog has saved his life. The power of these service animals to help veterans out is uh, the, these studies are are have been really incredible. And Bill, whenever you came back from Vietnam, do you do you feel if you would have gotten a service animal at that time, it would have helped you just uh, just the same? Knowing what I know now, probably. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was, um, you know, my my friends uh, would sit around and talk about 
fraternities and, and going to parties and, you know, and my nickname was Louie and I'd say, Louie, what have you been doing? And, I, and I'd say, you know, killing uh, VC and NVA soldiers, you know, and they'd look at me like, what's wrong with you? I mean, um, I just didn't want to be around people. Yeah. And Bill, I think, you know, your experience it kind of speaks to something that I often find is that with, you know, traumatic brain injuries and PTSD, I, you know, I wish more people understood, like, this isn't something that is going to go away. Like, I mean, in your case, it's still, you know, you still have moments throughout your entire life. It's not something that goes away. And that's too where, you know, you see veterans getting help from these dogs. It's like, they, they just have to manage this for their whole lives. It's not something that's just going to, you're wait, going to wake up one morning and it's gone. Yeah. And these, these dogs are with them 24 um, seven. You know, if in fact they, they, uh, the veteran starts to get a nightmare, that dog is in their face, waking them up, letting them know that I'm here, you know, I'm here. Um, you know, when, when Timmy first got his dog, he couldn't sleep more than, than two or three hours a night. And the first night that he got pilot, he slept through the night. With a, a guy, myself with a 13 month old, a, a, a good night's sleep, I, I completely understand how that can help your mental state. <laughs> Though I, I do not in any way relate that to someone dealing with PTSD. I just understand that less sleep is usually not good for you in the morning. And the more sleep you are able to get helps out your mental health dramatically. And I'm sure that a service animal helps uh, with that. Um, we've, we've already transitioned into our main story talking about the, these working dogs. And I also want to actually, because we've made the distinction now, Andrew, I want to uh, highlight your work again with the military working dogs, which is very different than service animals, very different than emotional support mm -hmm. animals. How did you begin working with military working dogs? And why did you decide to do that? So Back when I came into the program, uh, we actually just started back up about two and a half to three years ago, eh, probably about two years ago now. Um, it's called what we call the pipeline program. So you join uh, the military, the Marine Corps, um, the Army, you can actually enlist directly into the dog handler program. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Marine Corps, you have to become a law enforcement officer first, so a military policeman, and then you can apply to be a dog handler. Um, mm -hmm. On average, we only get anywhere between 70 to 80 new dog handlers a year. So the number, are, so our numbers are fairly small. Um, it's just really luck of the draw and, you know, fighting, fighting for what you want and getting in and getting what you want. It's really about how you come in. Um, the reason why I joined K9 and I wanted K9 is, once again, I have a really weird backstory with it. Um, back in high school, I played a lot of soccer. So we did indoor soccer, right? Basically soccer in a hockey rink. And we got into a huge, uh, huge brawl, you know, with another team, you know, parents are out there fighting, kids are out there fighting, you know, having a good time, you know, doing what kids do, you know, fighting and punching <laughs> each other. Um, Did not expect having a good time would be the, the response <laughs> to that. <laughs> uh, um, and then, so obviously the cops were called. So when the cops show up, you know, everyone, you know, police were there doing their thing. And then they started bringing in the dogs. Uh, believe it or not, I actually watched a guy just get completely torn up by a dog because he, he was still trying to fight. And then he tried to assault the officer. He had the dog. Dog just sat there and tore him to bits, just watching a full grown man just turn into a little baby. And I literally just stopped right there. I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do with my life. And from that point forward, that's really what I went for. And I never looked back on it. There are so many questions that I want to ask about this brawl. Like, like, why, why would you get so angry at a kid's soccer game that you would you would pummel another parent and then fight a cop and then <laughs> <laughs> then get hey, beat up by a canine? You know, I, I don't know. You know, we're all just it's like the heat of the moment. You know, everyone just wanted to fight. We're yeah. all like super anxious. You know, really high tension game. So we're like, hey. Let's just start swinging and That's, see what wow. happens. I so, feel like this person should know you're not going to beat the canine. Like, they're tough. No, you're, you're not. not. I mean, it don't matter how big and bad you are. I mean, 
those dogs, they sink their teeth into you. Believe me, it's not a good time. And you uh, really it, start second guessing your decisions at that point. Here, here's a good one for you. Um, we're on our way to Vietnam and we're in Okinawa and we had uh, slid off to Kim Village and, and, and picked up a couple bottles to, to bring back to the enlisted man's club and we're inside and um, we're in there drinking and all of a sudden um, they see us with a bottle and come over and, and said, we're gonna throw you out of the club and um, gentleman put his hands on one of the guys and the next thing you know, start a brawl. And so we're an enlisted man's club. There must be 200 guys fighting. Uh, they set the drapes on fire and the next thing you know, here comes the dogs. So they broke that up so quick and so fast that- uh, The dogs did. Oh yeah. Well, that that and, and uh, the MPs and the nightstick. So um, <laughs> but it, it was uh, it was a thing of beauty, you know. And, and, and for us, it was what are you going to do? Shave our heads and send us to Vietnam because that's where we're going anyway. And it was just it was a it was a brutal brawl. So to make you feel any better, Kin Town's about the same way nowadays too. So nothing changes. <laughs> Cab, dri cab driver still is crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, we got Marines, you know, literally happened a couple weeks ago, you know, got a little too uh, intoxicated, decided to, uh, you know what? I don't want to pay this guy. So I'm just going to beat him and take the cab from him. So. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, okay. So when did the military working dogs program start? How long has that been around? At the, at the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, and you're talking about 1941, uh, in the spring of 42, um, this Arlene Erlinger goes to like the American Kennel Club and a lot of the breeders and starts the dogs for defense. And this was the initiative to uh, have some type of a canine corps. At that time, there were only 50 and they were sled dogs in the military. And they were left over from uh, Bird's um, Antarctica trip. So they feel that the, the government says you need about 125,000 dogs. Um, and the, the, the public starts to donate dogs to these, from these different organizations and breeders and um, from 42 to 45, civilians donated over 40,000 dogs. And of those 40,000 dogs, 18,000 were accepted into the military. And 10,425 of them actually went on to advanced training. And that's when the, the Canine Corps was officially designated and saw duty over in the Pacific and Burma. You know, from there, uh, they had classified sentry dogs, uh, scout dogs, tracker dogs, detector dogs. It wasn't until Afghanistan and, and with, uh, uh, you know, the IEDs and, and the roadside bombs that it was actually General Mattis um, stated that maybe it was time to have military working dogs over in Iraq. My understanding is they went to North Africa and then from North Africa uh, over to uh, Afghanistan. So then what makes a good working dog? Because I hear you guys talking about breeders and stuff. So obviously these aren't just like random you know random dogs so like what makes a good dog because i'm sure even if you know you go to a breeder and they have this like you know a bunch of dogs there's still probably more like filtering you have to do to find you know the best the best candidates for this so uh, so right now um there's about 20 25 uh checklist um that they go through um that they run each and every single dog through um Every single dog gets tested in everything from their 
uh, environmentals, you know, is the dog willing to walk on hardwood floors? Is the dog willing to walk across carpet, grass, high, uh, high altitudes, rooftops, um, narrow planks that are, you know, 40 feet off the ground? Um, you know, just testing all the dog's environmentals. What is the dog scared of? Is the dog going to cower away from the uh, sound of gunfire? Is the dog going to cower away if you yell at it too loud? Um, all the way down to something as basic as the ear, ear size, tail size in comparison to the rest of the body. Um, something as simple as the tail being too short, you know, or even too long can actually uh, get the dog not being purchased for our use. Um, there's a whole bunch of aspects, you know, medical, um, they have to show the lineage, the bloodlines to make sure there's no uh, inbreeding that happens with the dogs. Um, what would, what would that, what would be the problem with that particularly? Inbreeding? Yeah. Same thing with humans. Okay. So it so, creates a mental disorder in some it way. It creates a lot of mental and extreme, especially with German shepherds that already have a little, quite a few medical conditions that we are pretty well known to us, you know, like hip dysplasia is mm -hmm. obviously a huge one. Um, I mean, it's the military, it's the government, you know, they want to get the most bang for their buck. You know, when you're spending five, six, seven thousand dollars on a dog uh, before any training even goes into it, you know, they want to make sure they get some kind of return on their investment. Right. Um, that they, they're not going to buy a dog in three years down the line, the hips aren't going to work. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, there's so much time, so much effort, so much money spent on these dogs annually that they don't really, that the return on investment needs to be high enough. Mm -hmm. So, on those trips, there's usually between five to six dog handlers and at least one, if not two, veterinarians that just go through and check dogs for medical conditions, bloodlines, um, drawing blood, doing you know different tests on you know field tests on it, you know, make sure that there's nothing in the blood that's uh, that would be an alarm that would cause an alarm. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. But one of the primary things that we do look for is obviously their hunt drive, um, the drive to, you know, that prey drive, if you will, you know, because dogs are natural predators, you know, they want to chase down rabbits, you know, and that's really what we refer to training as. Training's, training a dog is very easy. All you're really doing is tapping into the dog's natural instinct mm -hmm. and curtailing it to our benefit, right? So the dog naturally wants to sniff out prey. So instead of it sniffing out a rabbit, it's now sniffing out a bomb, mm -hmm. you know? So there's really no difference in the way we're training them. It's just taking those natural things that the dog does and just kind of altering it slightly to what we need. Um, so that's really a lot of the testing phase. And then once the dog comes into the program or gets purchased, then they go all down to the Lackland that's when they get put into the pipeline program and the training cycle. And then that's when they identify the washouts. And then when they identify those dogs that aren't going to be suitable for, you know, the fleet use, or they're more suitable as a single purpose. Um, that's when they'll adjust their training cycle for that purpose or for what they want out of that dog. And when did you come into the, into that, that pipeline, uh, being the, the kennel master in Quantico, uh, what, at what point did you receive the dog and then continue on, or did you get them near the beginning? So, so all the dogs are trained down at Lackland Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Um, the 341st, which is an Air Force unit is actually the executive agency, which means they own every single thing when it comes to dogs, they own every dog, they own the training schools. They train the dog training, or they own the dog training school. They own every facet of the military working dog program. Mm -hmm. um, as Marines, obviously, we don't like relying on other branches, and we're very prideful in ourselves and only ourselves. You know, so you know we're trying to not necessarily break away, but kind of try and because the way the Air Force likes to train dogs is for their purpose, right? Yes, they train the dogs to the best of their ability for a multitude of situations, but there's things that we find ourselves in as Marines a lot different than what the Air Force does or what the Army does and the Navy does. Um, so 
that's why we have, you know, the Yuma Proving Grounds, the Inner Service Advanced Skills Training Course, Canine Course that we we're talking about. Um, that way we can better teach Marines what Marines are going to do with dogs in comparison to what the Air Force does or the Army or the Navy does. Catherine, you have a question. Yeah, so then what, you know, you talk, and I'm sure Bill can kind of speak to this too. So then what are these dogs doing? Like they're trained, they're good, they're ready to go. You mentioned like there's different things that each branch needs the dogs to do. So what, like, what are they doing when they're finally done with training and ready to work? So for like the Air Force, um, their the Air Force primary mission is obviously airfield security. Um, you know, they have Minot Air Force Base, which is a nuclear reserve. You know, they have all those and that's their primary function and for and focus is more on that installation security, that perimeter patrolling. While Marines, well, we really don't want to do that, right? We want to go out there, we want to chase down the bad guy and shoot him, right? So we kind of curtail our training for that, you know. We don't like to be static. We like to always be on the forward attack, always on that forward movement, you know, towards the sound of gunfire. Um, so we need to make sure our dogs are still able to do that because as a dog handler, you're not going to be out on patrol by yourself, right? You're always going to be with a, uh, a victor unit, a line unit, grunts, you know, infantry guys, or you're going to be with, you know, the high speed, low drag, uh, MARSOC or Navy SEALs or, you know, so those super high, high speed guys that we're not really supposed to be talking about. Right. Um, so when you're with them, the last thing you can do is slow them down, right? You're an enabler. You enable them and you bring an extra capability to the fight. And that's really what we do as dog handlers is make sure that the dogs are just as capable of doing every mission that a human being is capable of doing. The Navy, are, you know, peer security, boat security, mm -hmm. things like that. That's not really what we focus on in our branch. Um and, and Andrew, how has uh, that training changed? So Bill, Bill mentioned a lot about like detective dogs and, and different ways that they're trained in different uh, specialties. Um, and has that expanded up until now? Is it still pretty much the same as it was, uh, you know, back in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, what the dogs are capable of? So yes, the dogs, so the capabilities are relatively the same. Um, like Mr. Bill was saying, you know, they had sentry dogs and scouting dogs. We don't use those anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have five main uh, focuses for our dogs in obviously the military and the Marine Corps, once again, want to get the most bang for their buck. We have dual purpose dogs, you know, dogs that are trained in attack and explosives or attack and narcotics. Or, you know, if you're looking at like the Marine Special Operations community or the, the JSOC, the Joint Special Operations, they, they call they use what we call multi-purpose dogs. So the dogs are trained in tracking, explosive detection, and uh, bite work. So they, so they pay a little bit more money for their higher end dogs, but they also get more capability out of them. So I want to so, hear, Andrew, I don't know if you're allowed to say this. Maybe Bill can say this since, um, <laughs> you know, he's not actively in the military. I want to hear, like, when you're talking to these dogs, like, how do you give them commands? Like, what, because you're talking about all these, like, highly specialized things that they do that are more than just, you know, hey, sit, stay. So, like, how do you give them commands? Like, what do these, what do these commands sound, commands sound like? I mean, Bill said they were training dogs in different languages. So nowadays, um, once again, all dogs are trained in English. Because um, once again, just because I know a foreign language doesn't mean the next guy will or mean that Mr. Bill does or Mr. Sean does, right? Mm -hmm. So all the dogs are obviously trained in English primarily. It's just simply that sit down, he'll stay, left, right, come, seek, get them. You know, all the different commands that we use, it, they're all very basic commands. Um, where the focus comes into is that one handler style of handling, right? So the dog understands that I'm dad, I give the toys, I give the praise, I give the reward, you know, and I also give punishment. So teaching that dog that only to listen to me is that's the key aspect behind what it is that we want to train the dogs for. Not necessarily the words and the commands, 
but it's more of, you know, teaching the dog understanding who is it that who's dad or who's mom right now. Mm. Right. So, and as the dogs get older um, and you have handlers rotating through and you have a dog that's been on four five, six different handlers, you know, that dog doesn't quite build that rapport with that individual handler anymore. So you'll start seeing the dog listening to multiple people. Um, Or if I show up with all the confidence in the world, dogs like, Oh, well, obviously this guy knows what he's doing. I'm following him. Right. So, so as the dogs get older, you will see a little bit more of that, but especially with the young dogs or that first handler dog, um, it's very, very distinct that you can tell on. It's, the, it's your child. So I guess this should have occurred to you before then, these child. dogs have more than one handler, right? Like, I mean, the same, you know, just because you train a dog doesn't mean it's going to be with you throughout its whole service. No, so the dogs are trained down at Lackland, like I was saying, um, by what we call DTS, the dog training school. Their entire job is to do nothing but basically pump dogs through the system, right? Um, They get dogs in, they teach them what they need to, they push the dogs out. Um, So by the time they leave there, usually they'll have two or three trainers. Um, Once they get done there, then they'll come to their individual installation, right? So at Quantico... If I had a dog that retired um, or just wasn't working out for what I needed, you know, I'd petition the headquarters Marine Corps and say, yo, by the way, I need a new dog. Um, And then obviously do the paperwork behind it and, you know, the purchasing request and all that other good stuff that, you know, all the paperwork and political stuff that has to go into it. Um, I fill all that out and then they send me a dog. Basically, they tell me, hey, dog's going to be on this plane. I show up to the airport, I pull the dog off the plane and off I go back to Quantico or back off to whatever installation the dog's going to. I know that whenever I have to yell at my dog for digging in the trash or eating the cat food, she gives me that puppy dog look or you know, ears down, tail between her legs and I instantly feel guilty. So Andrew, how do you punish one of your dogs and then deal uh, live with yourself afterwards? <laughs> so... It's like a child, right? Um, I mean, my wife, when I had my kids, you know, my wife always, she, she got a little irritated with me because she's like, you're literally training our child like you train your dogs. Because um, the psychology behind it is exactly the same. You know, I yell at my child, you know, I spank my child and he runs off crying and, you know, he cries for 20 minutes and just completely bawling. I feel bad about it. But there's obviously there needed to be consequence, right, for Mm -hmm. whatever action it was. Same thing with the dogs. Um, But luckily with dogs, since they have a little less understanding, I guess, if you will, than most children, um, you need to, once I give that correction, it's over. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hold you. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not going to look back on it you you did i gave you a command you failed to do it i punished you for it let's move on move you know, on. kind of mentality and that and that goes for both the handler and the dog and, and the, the dog, dog is more understand. capable of moving on than a, a child would be like a dog is just oh absolutely like, they, oh yeah they, they don't hold grudges nearly as bad as humans do <laughs> Um, I want to play a video real quick here, as I know that uh, we're coming up uh, on time here. But uh, Andrew, you had uh, an organization, a, a, a news source, uh, the Daily Caller, visit you when you were in Quantico. I'm going to share my screen here. And for those of you who are listening on audio, please jump over on YouTube and, and join us on there to see this video. Uh, there's a reporter that puts on, what would you call this suit that he puts on? So so that's just a bite suit. Um, the right suit here. that he's wearing there. If you look how thick it is, that we there call you that are. the marshmallow suit. Yep. Oh, there I am, yeah. We call that the marshmallow suit. That's the biggest one. It has the most padding available, which the dogs have so much bite force that uh, they'll leave what we call pressure bites and pressure marks, where it's just basically where the dog's teeth are sinking into the flesh, but it's not actually breaking the skin. So it's causing uh, individual like bruising right where the dog's teeth were, especially on those canine teeth. Mm-hmm. You'll get lots of bruising. You'll get, you know, sore for a little while. So we put them in the big suits like that because it protects them a little bit more. Um, for training, we don't use those um, typically because that that builds what we call 
uh, equipment oriented dogs. We don't want dogs, you know, focusing on the equipment and only looking for a guy wearing a big hefty suit like that. We want them mm. to bite the person, not the equipment. And you told this guy the pain train's coming, which I would not want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I would not want to hear the, that the knowing that this dog was coming after me. <laughs> the, the dog you see right there, um, or not right there, I, that's me. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of a dog too. But the dog <laughs> that we're about to use there, Here. Um, his his name's Mo. Um, he's an absolute love, uh, love bug um, when he wants to be, but... We clocked him at about 28 miles per hour when he was uh, when he was coming on a bite. Catherine, your face says it all because you That's said it whenever crazy. we yeah we saw oh. this video earlier and you said my dog that, that dog is going so fast and we'll see it here in a second and there he goes. <laughs> There's the takedown. Did did this guy get hurt at all? It, I hope he didn't bonk his head. So yeah, that's why pretty is there common. no head protection? <laughs> there is. We just don't use it. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. We just don't use it because yeah. it's really uncomfortable. Right. Uh, but see, that's Mo, um, the handler right there. So what he's doing right there is that's actually not hurting the dog. That's a common misconception. Mm -hmm. What he's doing right there, it's, a, uh, it's called a strong off method. All he's simply doing is grabbing the dog by the flat collar and uh releasing the dogs or you know choking the dog's airway off right so the dog has inherently a life decision to make either a i'm going to keep biting this guy or b i need to let go because if i let go i can start breathing again yeah. um it's really especially with that dog it's a 50 50 shot on which one he chooses um that dog's been passed out quite a few times because he refused to let go and you just hold the dog up until he passes out and then you just pry the jaws off himself off yourself and then the dog will just wake up. And then the dog just wakes up and acts like nothing happened and ready to go back to work. Ready to go again. I'm glad my boss doesn't do that to me. Oh my gosh. They're, <laughs> such, they're such beasts. Like knowing that this is even more like intense to watch. So if you, uh, if you go back for a second, you'll see it. If you look at his, see how he's climbing up the handler right there. Yeah. What you he's doing there is he's trying to get oxygen. Um, so the dogs, especially on the very small Malinois like that, mm -hmm. he tr they try and climb somebody's body in order to gain oh, oxygen, wow. Yeah, but still do what they want, which is bite that guy. Yeah. Incredible. Um, Bill, um, so can you tell us about your organization and, and the type of work that you've been doing? Well, Life Changing Service Dogs was founded um, by Tony Accomendo, George D'Angelo, um, 2015, um, they were at a organization uh, called Semperfy Odyssey, um, sponsored by General Jones to help military veterans transition from military life to civilian life when they saw a young Marine there uh, with a service dog. And they were intrigued and wanted to find out more information and they were told that the dog was trained by Guardian Angel Medical Service Dogs in Williston, Florida. Well, they were so impressed that they flew down to Florida and met with Carol Borden, who is the founder and CEO of Guardian Angel Medical Service Dogs. And Carol took them on a tour of the campus. They observed some of the training exercises and Carol uh, spoke to them and told them that, you know, these dogs were trained to mitigate physical and cognitive injuries, um, PTSD, uh, traumatic brain injury, insulin dependence, mobility issues, or a combination of both. And at that time, the VA was re reporting that 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Uh, the cost of a medical service dog was $25,000, two years to train, 1,500 hours, and the dogs are given to the veterans at no cost. So uh, Tony came back and uh, met with a, a group of individuals on Veterans Day uh, 2015 at Duquesne University. And they decided to 
uh, started an organization called Life Changing Service Dogs for Veterans. Their goal was to pair 22 veterans with 22 dogs in 22 months. Um, to date, they have raised $1.3 million, paired 30 veterans with 30 dogs. They have enough for 30 more. Uh, the problem being is that we've exceeded the capacity to train dogs down in Williston, Florida. So Guardian Angels has taken the initiative and they purchased 102 acres in uh, Washington County, Robinson Township, just outside of the, the Montour Trail. And we are going to attempt to build a new campus where we can raise or breed, raise and train medical service dogs similar to Williston, Florida, uh, in the hopes of training up to 80 dogs per year. Uh, right now, there is a waiting list, I believe, of over 300 veterans uh, that are waiting for a medical service dog. Um, and these dogs would, whether or not you're a, a diabetic, they would alert prior to you going into uh, an insulin uh, uh, dependent shock. Um, if you have a seizure disorder, these dogs alert and let you know prior to a seizure. Um, mobility issues. Um, these dogs uh, turn light switches on, open a refrigerator, bring medication to the veteran, uh, bring you a bottle of water. Um, they are with them 24-7. Mm -hmm. And if you see a, um, a veteran with a, a medical service dog, that service dog is always positioned between you and the veteran. Uh, it is his job to work with the veteran. He is there to support the veteran. So mm -hmm. um, we have Jack Wagner, who is the uh, former state senator, our general. He is the director of uh, development here for Guardian Angel Medical Service Dogs. Um, Jack is uh, talking to different corporations and foundations and seeking donations to help us uh, with our goal. We're looking at somewhere between uh, 15 to $20 million to complete this facility. Mm -hmm. Um, the Pittsburgh community has responded overwhelmingly in support of uh, life-changing service dogs and guardian angels. And we could have not reached where we are today without some of these organizations, the Pittsburgh Foundation, Armstrong Utilities, Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, Veterans Cable Service, uh, Duquesne University, PNC Bank, uh, Colcom Foundation, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Anybody can go to our website, padogsforvets.org, and you can actually go onto the donate page and donate for strictly for the Pittsburgh campus. We are hoping that on June the 5th at 31 Sports Bar and Grill, we will be doing a fundraiser there. Uh, so put that on your calendar. We'll have a meet and greet and uh, hopefully in the fall, we'll do another super bingo and Thank go you. on and, and, and take a look at the website, meet some of our veterans uh, and it will expand upon the history of uh, life-changing service dogs. Thank you, Bill. Andrew, do you think that you would uh, transition for, to, from military working dogs to, to service animals whenever you get out of the military? Um, probably not. Um, the main reason being is, uh, my end state is to probably end up with another federal agency working dogs. Um, I thoroughly enjoy, you know, the aggressive side of the house, you know, having been working dogs in law enforcement aspect for close to eight years alone. Um, I think that's kind of where my focus is, is training dogs for, you know, more for, aggressive actions than, you know, that defensive protective accent or actions. How do you train your kids? Just like I train my dogs. Um, yes. I, I want to know too. How do, how do I train my kids? So, 
<laughs> patience. Honestly, <laughs> believe it or not, one of the best one of the best courses I ever went to, um, college courses I went to, to learn how to train dogs was actually early childhood education. Mm-hmm. Very, very similar psychologically um, between dogs and a three to six year old. Um, so if you want to train, if you know how, if you can raise kids, then you can probably train dogs. And if you can train dogs, you'll be all right with it. Uh, Catherine, I wanted to give you the, the the last thoughts here. If you have any questions, no, I mean this is amazing, Bill. The work that you guys do is phenomenal because I've seen firsthand the impact that you know an animal can have on a veteran suffering with PTSD, and for them to have someone with them is amazing. And Andrew, I think the, the work you guys do is incredible too. I'm still thinking about that video and how fast that dog was. Like I'm terrified and i would never want to be on the wrong side of those dogs <laughs> what'd you say marines the best fighting force on, on the planet you want to have dogs that are just the absolutely same, right? i mean yep. it's a common thing that we mm -hmm. have you know not everyone respects the badge everyone respects the bite and if you have one if you could name one dog and you can only pick one name this is the one name you get to pick what is the name i'm gonna have to go with the dog i took on my second appointment igor oh igor. that's great awesome. Yeah. Bill? Well, um, I have to stay with Fraulein because, um, like I said, I, I walked this earth because of that dog. That dog was by my side and guided me and, and saved me. So um, Fraulein will ever uh, hold a place in my heart. Catherine? Well, my current dog, my mutt, uh, rescue mutt, is named Jimmy. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of loyal to the people names. I also have a dog named Louie. So I guess my next dog someday will also have some seemingly Italian sounding uh, dog name. <laughs> I, I have a couple different uh, dogs and have had a couple of different dogs with very different names. Um, but I remember when I was a kid, my dad had a German shepherd whose name was uh, Tara. And I would probably go with Tara because um, that was a real, that like kind of, you know, sparked my love of dogs was this beautiful gorgeous German shepherd named Tara and was just a cuddle cuddle dog just loved everybody uh loved kids uh just remember that dog so I'll go with that name I want to thank everybody for joining us for this episode of the Scuttlebutt. A uh, reminder to please like, share, subscribe, rate us wherever you get your podcasts, uh, and comment. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We do a mail call, and we'd love to call you out for uh, the, the questions that you have and answer those uh, here on our program. I want to thank Bill and Andrew, uh, both for joining us from the Marine Corps, both worked with military working dogs. Uh, and I'd like to thank Catherine again for joining us for another episode. Um, we are going to be back next week uh, with another great episode of the scuttlebutt hope to see you all there thank you so much for joining us